Hey, Daddy. Welcome, everyone, to Rewind, Recap, Relive, where legends and rising stars meet. I'm your host, Joan, and you heard that great introduction there. We've got a jam-packed episode, one of the best ones yet, I guarantee it. Before we get into all that, I want you to go right down below and drop your favorite Bill Alfonso moment in the comment section below. Had so much fun with these two, of course, as you saw the manager of champions, Bill Alfonso, legend in the wrestling business, on with the ultimate pusher, Tyreek Robinson. We've got some great things coming up as well. An exclusive giveaway different from anything we've ever done before and you're seeing it here first on Rewind Recap Relive so stick around for that. But first we got to get into the winner of the Hulkamaniac pin. Let's get to it. Congratulations, brother. The wheel has spoken. You're the winner. We'll get in touch with you. Rip your shirt off. Have a party. Won the Hulkamaniac pin and the Hulkamaniac stickers, courtesy, of course, of the champs over at Wrestling Pins, where you could satisfy all your pin needs. Not only the Hulkamaniac pin, but the ninth wonder of the world pin, the Hitman pin. They've got the bad guy. They've got the dead man. They've got Barry. You hear me say it every single week, and trust me, it's no gimmick. Wrestling Pins is legit. Go over there right now and type in RRR15 off to get 15% off your next wrestling pins order courtesy of us at Rewind Recap Relive. Head over there, grab your pins right now. All right, listen, Daddy, now you gotta listen up because we've got something exclusive that you're not seeing anywhere else except Rewind, Recap, Relive first. You are the first viewers who have the chance to win this commemorative, exclusive, legendary, extreme championship whistle signed by the manager of champions himself, Bill Alfonso. We're giving one away, one lucky winner. All you have to do is go right down below in this Bill Alfonso episode on YouTube and comment hashtag R3 giveaway. That's all you gotta do and you will win a signed Bill Alfonso whistle. Trust me, it's worth it. It's such a cool piece of wrestling history from the man himself. He's sending them right over. So comment, hashtag R3 giveaway right down below. And in two weeks time, you got two weeks until this giveaway is up, your name will be announced on our next episode as the winner. Enter right now. Be the first to own the Extreme Championship Whistle. So two weeks time is when you find out if you won that giveaway on our next episode. But for now, go back and watch all of our other 40 interviews that we've released on the channel. There are tons. Find yourself one that you love after, of course, you finish this incredible manager edition of the show. It does not disappoint. We talk Andre the Giant. We talk Rob Van Dam, Sabu. ECW. We talk the NWA, which Tyreek has recently been on. Bill, of course, has a vast history there. We talk refing Giant Gonzalez and Undertaker at WrestleMania 9. We talk Bruiser Brody and Lex Luger in the Steel Cage. We talk so much more. Bill Alfonso is just a fountain of wrestling stories, and it's amazing we're able to get him on the show along with Tyreek, so you're going to enjoy it. Make sure you head right down below, click subscribe, hit the notification bell, share it around, tell everyone that you're watching the Manager of Champions with a future Manager of champions in the ultimate pusher, Tyreek. And I'll see you soon. Our first guest has been in the wrestling business for two years. First as a referee and now as a manager, he's had some great moments thus far, talking Chopamania. He did some work with NWA. Please welcome the ultimate pusher, Tyreek. Hey, how you guys doing? Doing good. Very happy to have you on with our next guest, who is an absolute legend in the business. Over 40 years going strong, still in it today. He's been in the middle of many historic matches and has led a lot of fellow legends to gold. Please welcome the manager of champions, Bill Alfonso, to the show. Hey, what's up, Daddy? <laughs> hey, Jonah. Iconic. Good. How you doing? I'm doing excellent, baby. Down here in Tampa Bay, living my dream. Uh, healthy as hell. Uh, work out every day, eat good, um, lean and meat, daddy, and still running strong, baby. Good, good. That is what we like to hear. And first, so I'd love to start at the beginning. Tyreek, if you want to just take us through how you got into the professional wrestling business. Gotcha. So, I mean, always when I was a kid growing up, I was just drawn to wrestling. But I really took it far enough to where I started doing amateur wrestling, doing high school. And once I graduated high school, I was like, you know what? Let me see if I can wiggle myself into the business. So I ran across this company called Jeffy W, and they loved me so much that they helped me, uh, you know, train 
to become a referee. And over the couple of years, I've been just going to different shows, you know, running as much as I can, being a sponge, breaking down rings, putting up rings, and uh, just really just trying to sponge up everything that I could. And yeah, it got me back to the point where, okay, I've been in the business for a year now, and I'm watching these guys get this thing called heat. Because, you know, I'm still green, so I'm still learning the terminology. And I watch these guys get heat. They're the fans, they hate them. I'm like, you know what? That's who I want to be. So I started learning. I started looking at people like uh, Paul Heyman. I started looking at people like Bobby Heenan. And yours truly, Mr. Fonzie, right here, I've been watching the great managers in the past, picking yeah. up on terminology, movement, and I developed this character called the Ultimate Pusher, Tyree. Just last year, my first show managing was actually last year in uh, April. And I met Mr. Fonzie there at A. RW and took a picture of him. Wow, you remember that, Bill? Absolutely. How could I forget that handsome kid? <laughs> exactly. Well, as we said, over 40 years in the business, can you take us when you first broke into it? What was your journey like? My journey was pretty cool. My dad came home. He was a friend of the sports editor for the Tampa newspaper. And he used to write the results for, and, and put the ad in for Florida Championship Wrestling, which they had on Tuesday nights. Eddie Graham, Greg Malenko, Jose Lazario, Sailor Rock Thomas, and so on. So um, my dad came home with two passes. I didn't know anything about wrestling. He said, hey, Billy, uh, my friend gave me tickets to wrestling. You want to go? I said, well, I don't know anything about it, but I'll go check it out. So my first night going to Florida Championship Wrestling in this, uh, maybe the... Uh, early, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, when I walked in there and seen Eddie Graham with that blonde hair and Bobby Shane and Bobo Brazil and the Sheik and all these cats, I said, man, that's what I want to do. I got hooked on it that night and studied it, went, went for a couple of years and watched the matches. And uh, then I started meeting the wrestlers. I met Rocky Johnson and King Curtis, Mark Lewin, and they all, uh, liked me a lot and I would start running going to get them sandwiches and this and that and you know I wanted to wrestle but I'm 155 pounds back then right so the closest thing to they said hey Fonzie you know what you love the business you'd make a great referee you're gonna make us look big you're small you love the business and I'd fit right in so eventually I went out to uh Texas and they had four territories at the time they had Joe Blanchard San Antonio that Paul Bosch just ran Houston. They had the Von Erics in Dallas and they had the Funks in Amarillo. So there was four different territories in one state. So I was bouncing around trying to get a job there and um, Rocky Johnson sent me out there. And, but they had David Manning, they had Bronco Lubitsch already, they had all the referees. But one night, a couple of times, uh, I was out there six months <clears throat> and I worked like six times in six months. So I said, man, oh, I got wow. I got to go back to Florida. I can't survive yeah. out here working six times. So uh, Paul Jones, you remember Paul Jones? He just recently passed away. Um, he's a big time wrestler in the 70s and 80s. He took a liking to me. He said, hey, when you get to Florida, why don't you go to the Florida office, Eddie Graham's office, and tell him I sent you. Tell him you work for Joe Blanchard, which I did. Tell him you work for the Funks, which I did. Tell him you work for Paul Bosch, which I did. Tell him you work yeah. for the Von Eric's, which I did. So I went to Flor 106 North Albany, where Florida Championship Wrestling's office was, and set up a meeting with Jerry Briscoe and told Jerry this and that. He said, well, unfortunately, right now we got our referees, but leave your name downstairs. This was a Monday. Listen to this. This is where it gets cool. Okay. This is a Monday. So um, I said, well, okay. uh, Jerry Briscoe said, leave your name because maybe this summer we'll be running two shows on the weekends and we could possibly use you. I said, well, thank you very much, Jerry Briscoe. And I left my name. Tuesday morning, they call me because the, one of the referees that was full time had, they were running West Palm Beach, which was sold out. It was Dusty and somebody and uh, the Mask Assassin, uh, Nick Patrick's dad, Jody Hamilton, okay. against Dusty's sold out crowd. And the referee had, three of the guys in the car that were on the card in West Palm Beach. He had a flat tire with no spare on like Alligator Alley or something. They yeah. missed the show. Dusty was livid. He fired a guy on the spot. So I get a call Tuesday morning 
Hey, Fonzie, this is Charlie Lay from Florida Championship Wrestling. Dusty wants to know if you can make tonight and referee at the, at the armory Tuesday night. I said, yes, sir, I sure can. What time do you want me to He said, six o'clock. I said, great. So I walk into the dress room at six o'clock. It was only me and Dusty. Dusty was a booker. I walk in. I said, I'm Bill Alfonso. I'm the referee. He said, oh, great to meet you. I'll get with you in a little bit. Uh, have a seat. So I sat down and all the guys start coming in, Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo and Steve Kerr and yeah. Bushwhackers. That was, uh, they were called the Kiwis back then. Uh, a bunch of guys, uh, Bobo Brazil, Jack Briscoe, they all start walking in. I introduced myself to them. And at the end of the night, they said, hey, can you work uh, Wednesday in Miami? At the end of that night, can you work Thursday in Jacksonville? At the end of that night, can you do the spot show Saturday? And uh, how about Sunday in Orlando? And that night in Orlando, Jerry Briscoe came up to me and said, congratulations, you got a job full time with us. And I was wow. there 10 years, Florida Championship Wrestling. I was bred there, learned all my skills right there as a referee. And they were very intricate, very intricate uh, finishes, so on and so on. I was learning from Dusty and Andy Graham, the, the super brains of the business. Yeah. And I did real well. And then that from uh, then cable started taking over. So I ended up working for uh, Ted Turner going up at WCW. That's why I did the 65,000 people in Tokyo, Rick Flair against Fujinami and so right. on. Then I ended up going to WWF and did WrestleMania nine and so on. I finished up there. Paul Heyman calls me, says, Fonzie, <laughs> we want you to come to ECW. I said, what the f***'s an ECW? Because I'm going to <laughs> extreme Florida championship wrestling, WCW, Ted yeah. Turner. This big man, WrestleMania, and then this, I've never worked an indie show in my life. Little did I know they were successful. So I went up there for a four week gig. They had planned on me being a anti violent commission referee, just fresh. I was still on Monday. I was still, because they would, at uh, that time, they were taping one live show Monday Night Raw. The second show was a, um, a tape, and the third show was a tape, and they show them every three weeks would do three shows Monday Night Raw. Uh, and actually I was on the first Monday Night Raw. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yep. I remember. On the first one, Marty Gennetti, who beat uh, Shawn Michaels for the belt and so on and so on. So, uh, um, so I go to ECW and my character got over and instead of me being there four weeks and get choke slammed by 911, Paul Heyman had this brilliant idea for me to go with Taz. Taz had, Taz had, had like four or five different gimmicks and never really got over. It was Tasmania, Monkey Boy, or whatever the f he was. Then right. they put me and Taz together. He became Taz, and I became uh, Bill Alfonso, the manager, which was great. Had a year with him. Then our first pay-per-view, Barely Legal, I switched on Taz and went with Van Dam and Sabu. Had the two top guys in the room. Yeah. And, uh, and I had five years later. You know what I mean? I was working two days a week. I made a quarter million dollars working two days a week for five, you know, five years. <laughs> Not a, a quarter million a year, fifty thousand right. dollars a year working two days a week. That flying me up with me in the hotel was right. fantastic. fantastic. Well, it sounds That's like why it. I'm relevant today, Joan. I'm yeah. Relevant today because of ECW. That's absolutely true. Yeah, everybody definitely knows you as the uh, as RVD Sabu Taz as you brought up, but you did so much before that. Not a lot of light has been shed, and I want to get into those. Tyreek, just to hand it over to you, your first match that you ref, how was that for you? Oh, actually, um, I had been bugging the promoter uh, at the company for like three months. Like, hey, can I ref? Hey, can I ref? Hey, can I ref? So one Friday night, I'm, I'm, I live in Macon, Georgia. I love Macon, Georgia. James Brown, woo! <laughs> yes, sir, I'm with James Brown, yes, sir. So uh, I live in Macon, and... Um, the company was like in Fort Valley. So he tipped me one night out of the blue AK. Still want to ref? I'm like, yeah, yes, sir, I do. He said, be here in 30 minutes. Now, this is a 45 minute drive. I get in my little 06 uh, Honda Accord and I push it all the way on the interstate. Doing Hell yeah, you did. Hell yeah, you did, brother. And uh, I didn't own a ref shirt. I didn't, I, I didn't have anything on. Uh, he provided the ref shirt. He said, hey, keep, keep, keep it. And my first match that I ref was uh, Michael Stevens. Uh, he's one of the, he's like a known guy here in Georgia. Uh, he actually just did some work with uh, Better Be in WrestleMania like a couple of days ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I ref his match, and like I said, green as 
you know, <laughs> trees. Uh, never left a match in my life, but you know, I've seen it on TV a while, you know, so I kind of, I knew the rules and the basics and, you know, I got, I got around and um, that's really how my night went and I took my first bump that night as well. Oh, good. Pretty cool story, Daddy. Hey, we all got stories of how we got in and that was pretty damn cool, kid. Yeah, yeah. it was. Often being at the right place at the right time. You know, yeah. sometimes, but you got to have the talent to back it up. They can stick you in a position, but you better be talented because here's the problem. There's 5,000 of us and there's only 20 jobs as manager and referee. There's 10,000 wrestlers that can wrestle their ass off, but the problem is there's only 300 spots, you know, WWF and now AEW to make a living. You know what I mean? Other than that, you work at Indies, which is fine. Indies are great. You work on weekends. I work, I'm booked all the way through August. I'm working every weekend all the way through August. And now um, I'm booking up all the way through the end of the year. I was flying up to Cleveland four times a month working for AIW and they were doing a thousand people with Matthew Justice and John Thorne as the owner. And now I'm working tomorrow night in South Florida for CCW. I manage Ariel Levy. He's a Chilean superstar and the Brazilian giant. He's been knocking people out since he was 12 years old, daddy. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that you're still elevating this talent. I want to go back to a famous match that you were right in the middle of, uh, like many. Oh, Lex Luger? Lex yeah, Luger. You, you pulled it right out of me. I have a few, but that was the first one I was going to go I to. I get Luger a lot of that when I do these, uh, Jonah, when I do the conventions yeah. and stuff, the uh, most frequent question, hey, tell me about the Lex Luger Brody match in the cage. Tell me about you and Beulah where you almost bled to death. Tell me about Rick Flair and Bruce and I mean 65,000 people. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. So that's uh, almost the number one story that I always get asked still to this day. Lex Luger is a dear friend of mine, and it was a shame what happened to Bruce and Brody. He was a dear friend of mine, too. Yeah. It was a shame. Do you have any, could you take us inside what it was like being in the yeah, cage? That night, that? that night in the cage? Yeah, yeah certainly. So um, it was at the War Memorial in Fort Lauderdale. It was a bad booking to begin with. So Lex Luger had been in the business about a year, a little over a year. We trained him to be a superstar. We were hand selecting his opponents. Remember he played football. He was a good looking kid, had that great body. So they wanted to make him the next big superstar. And, and they did. You know, he pulled up, he wore that wife beater t-shirt, ripped it off in that beautiful body. But they were hand selecting his opponents and all that. And, and guys that can work and teach him and stuff in the ring. They wanted, they rushed him too quick. <laughs> so then they booked this match between um, Bruiser Brody and Lex Luger in a steel cage. Now, Brody's temperamental. He's high strung. He's been around the world. He's been in Japan. He's been this. Who the hell is Lex Luger? He's a new kid in the, in, in the business. He looks great. He's been, you know, um, so there was some friction right there. Nothing against Brody. Brody just, you know, he's temperamental. And um, they, they didn't talk before the match. And the, the office wasn't there. Like the Florida Championship Wrestling office was not there. They sent all the finishes with me, Bill Alfonso, the referee. Okay. I was that cool. Uh, I could handle the show. Um so I explained to Brody what, you know, we want to do and stuff. And, but so bell time came, they rang the bell, they locked the cage and Luger just freaked out because he, he didn't know what to do. He should have listened to Brody. Brody would have walked him through it. He didn't. And he started off like he usually starts off and, and uh, uh, Bruce and Brody manhandled him a little bit and wouldn't sell right. and, Luger freaked out. I said, Fonzie, what do I do? I said, well, throw me, grab me and throw me against the cage. I'll disqualify you or something. You know, he wanted to get out of there. He, right. uh, and so you see the tape. You can watch it on YouTube. Yeah. You see Luger grab me, throw me against the cage, and I'll ring the bell. And Luger crawls over the top of the cage and splits. So there was actually no match. It was lasted about six minutes or something. So it was a tragedy, but it should have been a good match. But it was a bad booking. They shouldn't have put Luger in there with Bruce Brody in a steel cage. Right. I just I just got done watching that. Definitely cool they trust you with that responsibility of all the finishes, right? So that oh, yeah, match yeah. I've been yeah. in business for, since May of 1980. Well, it was 78 right. in Texas and all that, but I was Dusty's guy. I was his left-hand man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting assistant booker there in the state of Florida for a long time. I went to so wow. many bookers there. Dusty, Bob Roop, uh, well, McDaniel, Dory Funk Jr., uh, different bookers. I can't even remember them all. 
Right. And they so all ask names. me, they all ask me for advice. When these new bookers come in, Fonzie, you've been here five years. What I do in this town? What I do here? What I do there? So I was giving the bookers advice. And, and you always I, had the if answers. I, yeah. I, if I'm giving you advice, hire me to be the assistant booker. You know, give me a supplement pay. I'll right, right. Pay you subsidize for assistant booking. And they did. And they did. And I made good money. Absolutely. Well, Tyreek, I want to go to a moment for you now that was pretty cool. A cool experience for you was you worked Talking Shop Mania, right? With Big LG, Luke Gallows, Doc Gallows. You want to talk about that experience being on Talking Shop yeah. with all the guys? Oh, man. So, actually, uh, it all started when I was uh, jumping from the indie team. The guy that I uh, left my first match for, uh, he actually asked me, say, hey, kid, uh, Gallows, he has a promotion in Jackson, Georgia. Do you want to rep here? I'm like, the gallows, that guy that I see on TV that I was just watching a couple of days ago, yeah, I will most definitely come. So um, it started then, and I started working with him. Uh, after he got released, we got close, and um, he created this character for me called uh, Smoko Beware. Uh, it was a- <laughs> Smoko Beware. Not Smoko Smoko Beware, Beware, right? He's the yeah. big bird, man. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, so instead of me having an actual bird, I had this toy chicken that when you squeeze it, it makes that noise. And really? um, that's so cool. Wig. Yeah, I had this crazy wig, and we just shot so many crazy stuff with that uh, character there. And it got over very, very much on the social media. Everybody's always asking what smoke holds up to. So that's kind of like it. my <laughs> Bill, for you, so I know this is jumping around now, but you actually were the referee in the Gonzalez and, and Undertaker match, right, at WrestleMania 9. WrestleMania 9, Daddy. Jesus yes. Palace sold out. Yeah, God, that was one of my of that biggest one. paydays. That was one of my biggest single paydays in the business. Oh, I'll tell you what crazy. I made that night. You wouldn't believe it. And Paul, <laughs> Heyman, Paul Heyman on the first pay-per-view in ECW, Barely Legal, Paul yeah. Heyman said, Fonzie, I don't know what to pay you. You know, we did well on the pay-per-view. We did a good buy rate and all that. He said, I don't know what to pay you. I said, well, pay me the same thing Vince paid me at WrestleMania 9. He said, okay, how much was that? And I told him, and he paid it. it was very Did cool. he really? Wow. Yeah, Paul Heyman was very generous with me. I love Paul Heyman. He's still my dear friend. Todd Gordon, too. I talk to Todd once a week. He's one of my dear friends. I talk to Van Damme all the time. In fact, they just, they're shooting a documentary on Van Damme, and Vince McMahon flew two camera people a sound guy and a producer to my home in Tampa, Florida. And I did a three and a half hour shoot. They paid me big money because I was Van Damme's manager wow. at ECW. Yeah. Did a lifetime yeah, documentary. He's just a hall of famer. So that's going to be released uh, late May and that's going to elevate me again. So I'm working my ass off all the time, but always doing yeah. podcasts all the time and um, why I'm healthy. I'm, I'm going to go till I can. I think that's for the WWE icons thing that they're doing for that. If I remember, they're doing yeah, something for Van Damme. Uh, uh, they did what Yoko was doing, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was I was all over that one too. I was all over that one too, refereeing and stuff. People would tell me I haven't seen it. But, right, right. And this one, it was uh, a good one. It was a really good followed, one. And after the three and a half hour uh, shoot, they probably used three minutes of it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then they followed us out to Stevens Point, um, Wisconsin, and Van Dam uh, had a match with. Um, some hardcore veteran warrior, badass, and would place was sold out. And Katie was there, so me, Katie, and Van Dam went to the ring and went through a table. They the, and the documentary people uh, were there. So as soon as I go through the table with the guy Van Dam was working with, Van Dam five star frog splash pinned him one two three. So that's probably going to be in the in the in in the documentary. In the documentary, yeah, yeah. Like Katie, he's an under man. It's going to be on all kind of stuff. So very cool. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Going back to that WrestleMania nine match, everyone, a lot of fans remember the the finish was the chloroform on, uh, on Gonzalez for Undertaker to, to get the win. I think it was a, was it like a no contest type of finish? I forget exactly what the official ruling was. Because during the match, um, they got it, they built it up and then, uh, Jack Gonzalez ended up grabbing me by the throat and choke slamming me. He's the tallest yeah. athlete on the planet. He was taller than yes. Ming that played basketball for Houston. You know the Chinese guy, Ming. For yeah, him. yeah, I think so. How, yeah, how tall? Middle. How tall exactly was Gonzalez? I heard that when he died, he was eight feet. Is that true? Uh, yes, right wow. at eight foot. Yep. Wow. Yep. That is. And, and so he choke slam. He choke slam me during the match. And you're not supposed to put your hands on a referee 
in Las Vegas because they have a real strict athletic commission. They fined um, John Gonzalez $10,000 for manhandling the referee on the shoot, on the serious shoot. And of course, Vince paid it because oh, wow. it was part of the finish. Right. Uh, and, you know, he, uh, you know, he gave me a stunner. It's hard to be up. Uh, if John Gonzalez is eight foot and his arms are three, uh, four foot long, I was up there like 12 feet getting drove down to the canvas. He actually gave me a stunner, almost knocked my ass out. But that was the finish, and it was pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty damn cool. It's very cool watching it back. And you were his, you were his agent? Personal assistant. I was personal assistant. Personal assistant for the largest pro athlete on the planet for three years. All over the world, all through Japan, all over the United States, every major arena. Uh, uh, can you imagine working in the most? What? Hey, Donna, let me ask yeah. you a question. What's the most famous arena on the planet? Madison Square Garden. You damn right it is, brother. And guess yep. who was there? Me, Bill Alfonso. You. That was cool. Right there in the middle. <laughs> My God, a little kid from West Tampa, Florida, started off with Dusty and Eddie working for WWF at the time at Madison Square. It was pretty cool. Uh, the LA Forum, you know, Nassau Coliseum, every major arena in the United States I worked in. Of course, for wow. WWF and the WWF. Yeah, the yeah of course. WWF were smaller venues, but, you know, we did a really good business. No, what an accomplishment, definitely. You went from West Tampa, right? That's where you originally yes. was? Yeah. All the way to Madison Square Garden. Well, Tyreek, I got to ask you now. Uh, so you recently did some work with National Wrestling Alliance, NWA, as I said. Can you talk about that experience for you? Because I know Bill obviously has history there as well. Honestly, uh, just me being who I am, uh, the ultimate pusher is just not a gimmick. It's just who I, am. I, I always try to take uh, my opportunities, you know. So uh, Mr. Bill Barron, he's a huge, huge uh, person in Georgia, and but just in the rest of business, period. He helps with the NWA. And I just hit him up on Facebook because I was like, hey, you guys need to really help at all um, come up the wing. Um, and he said, yeah, man, uh, I'm glad that you asked. He invited me to come uh, to Atlanta where they were taking it last month. I came and helped put the ring. Got invited back the next couple of days to help uh, with the crowd. And um, I shot some videos in the back. I, you know, I told him, hey, um, I'm also a talker. I can commentate, broadcast, interview. I do it all. And um, that's kind of how I got my foot in the door with them. And um, now they have a pay-per-view called When the Shadows Fall, uh, June 6th on Fight TV. And uh, hopefully I can get invited back to that. So uh, that's really what happened last month. Bill, how about you with N when it comes to NWA? I know that you were around when they announced the very first Starcade main event, right? Yeah, well, we didn't have pay-per-views back then. So we have big, big uh, shows. And... Yeah. Uh, they were really cool. Yeah, we would have like 16 shows in a row, like Super Summer Shizzlers, Starcade, not, you know what I mean? It was pretty damn yeah. cool the way Dusty put it together because we didn't have access to cable TV and all that yet, and pay-per-views. So we did it that way. The big shows were once a year during the summer, Super Summer Shizzlers, there'd be like 16 of them. One in, uh, start off in like uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Atlanta. Um, you know, Tommy Rich lives in LA. Lower LA, Lower Atlanta. <laughs> Lower LA. That's a uh, dear question. But uh, he's a dear friend of mine. Uh, you know, we were in Charleston, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Tampa, all these big shows and, and football stadiums like Tampa Stadium. We would fill half of it up, you know, 30,000 people, 25,000 people, 18,000 people. So quite successful. Those are great to be on. Great to be on. A hey, uh, um, uh, ultimate. Uh, uh, my brother, I wish you would have been a few years back, you know, started a few years back because you just missed having a full time job. You know what I mean? There was plenty of work. I was the NWA was around. They would correspond with there was different territories like Florida was a territory. Georgia was a territory. Mid-Atlantic Jim Cotton was a territory. Texas was a territory. Oregon, Kansas City was Harley Race's territory. Uh, so they will all correspond, but you, you can bounce from, uh, you can go into Florida and work for two years and go, they'll send you to Dallas for two years and they'll send you to Oregon for two years. And so you missed it by a few years. So you work in the indie shows, don't get discouraged ever uh, because, you know, we're, we're drawing small people because of the virus. Um, uh, 
and they don't have big money to pay you. Is it worth it to drive 200 miles to make 100 bucks? you damn right it is because something may happen. Somebody may see you being in the right place at the right time. You're living your dream. You love the business. Obviously, you won't, you won't be in it. You're a good looking kid. So uh, do you gimmick, brother? And you know what I mean? Get that name out there. Get that name out there. Now you with me. Now you with me. I know your background. You're a referee and a manager just like me, daddy. I help you in any way I can. Don't ever hesitate to get a hold of me on social media. We'll exchange numbers later. I love I love seeing I love being just a fly on the wall of this of this meeting right here. So, Bill, you you brushed on it earlier before you made the swap to manager. You you were brought in as an official to ECW and you told us how Paul Heyman called you and all that. How was that making the swap from from official to manager for you? Just because ECW has like that legendary heat and you were right there and going to be in the middle of it. So what do you think about that? Well, I guess I was prepared for it because I had been in the business over 20 years at that point. That was May in 95 when I went, I had worked for Florida wrestling and WWF and WCW. So I had my fill. I was, you know, one of the better referees in the country. That's what they say. Hey, I'm a legend in my own mind, daddy. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was pretty cool being, but I, I was prepared for it. But what I did wasn't prepared for was doing all the promos. So, because the referee doesn't do a lot of promos. Of course, I probably did 20 or 30 right. promos in 20 years. Like, oh, dude, over the top rope, no disqualification. And then, you know, I was uh, featured on some stuff with Gordon Soli and stuff with small parts, you know. Then they have a lot of speaking parts. And I find, found it a little difficult to do promos. And then Tommy Dreamer and Paul Heyman came up to me and said, what's the problem, Fonz? You can't spit out a promo. And I said, well, I'm just, you know, I'm having, and they said, just treat it like a shoot. Fonzie, you know, you're managing Rob Van Dam. You know, you're in uh, Philadelphia on June 26. You know, it's going to be a tough match. You know, the opponent. So I said, oh, I get it. So uh, then I was one take Fonzie. I would say, hey, daddy, May 25th at the ECW arena, me and my man, RBD, the whole effing show, daddy, we're going to kick your ass, uh, Sandman. You're a beer drinking cane swinging freak you ain't got a chance against my man van damme so i just told it like it was i treat right. it like a shoot i know i'm gonna be in philadelphia in the 26 i know i'm gonna manage van damme i know we're fighting the sandman and then i was one take fonzie now i'm you know known for my promos yeah absolutely renowned i love that one take fonzie how about you do, do you resonate with that at all tyreek yes i mean uh Starting off, um, just me as a person, I love to talk. And I got word of advice from everybody. Like, hey, man, you know, when you send promo, just take it up a notch. Be you, but be you times two. And the reason why they were so drawn to me to become a manager, because I cut a promo for uh, Doc Gallows, uh, and it was just, you know, I've always been his ref, his referee, still is, but I cut a promo for him just to promote. And everybody was amazed because they was like, damn, this guy's a referee, but he has a different gap. Like, why is he not talking more? You need him to talk more. So All right, Tyree. Hey, Tyree, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Do a promo on me. Man, you're going to manage uh, Sabu, and I'm going to manage Van Damme. So do a, cut a promo on me. And the date's uh, May 15th. We're going to meet at the ECDW Arena. You got Sabu, and I got Van Damme. Go ahead, kid. May 15th. Live at the ECW Arena, you're managing Sabu and I'm managing Van Damme. Let's see what you got. In five, four, three. It's the Ocean of Pusher Tyree, and I'm here right now with my main man, Sabu, the ECW West. And since we're talking about legends, let me go ahead and tell you this right now. Guess what? May 15th in the ECW Arena, my man Sabu is going to take on the coaches, guys, we're going to take on RVD and Mr. Fonzie. <laughs> First off, I know we haven't met, but May 15th, you will. If you feel like you're going to get involved, I want you to take that whistle, shine it up real nice, and I'm going to shove it with the sun it doesn't shine. So please, be advised. Don't get involved, because it's not going to be pretty. And for you, RVD, you're going to be one table slam away from a one, two, three. Referee is going to raise up Sabu's hand, and it's going to be done just like 
Hey, Daddy, you talking about my whistle, Ultimate Pusher, Daddy? Are you ready for the whole effing show? You better have the uh, suicidal, homicidal, genocidal Sabu at his A game, Daddy, because Van Damme is the man. You better count your blessings that you even make it through the match. And trying to shine my whistle up for you, I will, because I might stick it up your ass, Daddy. That was amazing. That, that was on the you fly. Guys, that was on the fly. Look, that I was on the get out of the spot. He was great. And I followed up. And so yeah, we're natural. We're both naturals. Uh, Tyree, good for you, kids. That was a great promo. I'll put you on the spot in a second. You, you blew it out. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say he's at, I don't know if you know, Bill, he's at work right now. And I don't know if he I cut hear, that in I front hear. of coworkers, but but that was great. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hear the background. I thought he was at home or something, but with kids and stuff. But uh, the figures he's at work. It's um, even funnier, uh, yeah. Very cool, very cool. You, your uh, workmates must think you're crazy. It's like <laughs> yeah. uh So speaking of what we just saw a lot of that whistle, where does the whistle come into play? The iconic whistle and, you know, obviously Fonzie Daddy. Where does all that come in? Oh, I'm going to show you where it comes in. Check this out. Uh, released by Mattel Toys. Okay, that's the... Wow, look at that. Whistle. That's the front of the whistle. And here is the uh, back of the whistle. Let me show you, baby. It's pretty, pretty effing cool. And it's going to be released. I have them on sale. That's so cool. You sell them signed and everything? I'll sign them at events and stuff. I'll sign them yeah. at events. Nobody's going to open them. And nobody else. Oh. Look, when I do these conventions, I'm doing one May 15th in Baltimore. They're expecting 3,000 people. It's a big wrestle fest. Um, so I'll take some whistles there. And everybody, the 30 wrestlers that are going to be there are selling T-shirts and pictures. I'm the only one in the business that has a captured whistle that looks like it came from Mattel, you know, toys. Yeah. Boxed up, beautiful. It looks professional as hell. And I'll sell the hell out of them. And nobody's yeah, going to open them. Really I'll, well. sign, I'll sign them. Everybody's going to want one, Daddy. Yeah, so that's absolutely. No, that's a unique piece of memorabilia, which I love. I'll, I'll definitely, I'll be all over one of those whistles. Oh, thank you. Hey, hey Jonah, I uh, let me comment. You got to play the part. You got to look the part. You look like a million dollars today, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Oh, beautiful, Styling brother. Your background, everything. I love it. I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, want to create back. a good spot, good spot to come for sure. Oh, hell yeah, Daddy. So... When I became Taz's manager, you know, when I came into ECW, I was supposed to come in for four weeks as an anti-violent referee. And right. then they put me with Taz, right? So Paul Heyman said, Fonzie, this is your new gimmick. You know, you dress like orange and black like Taz. You make the Taz hat. And I want you to blow a whistle. So he gave me a whistle and I blew it that night. And I was embarrassed to blow it. I was embarrassed to blow the whistle. I don't know why. So the next week, I left it at home on purpose. And Paul Heyman says, where's your whistle, Fonzie? Uh, I said, oh, I forgot it. He said, Fonzie, that's your gimmick. That's your gimmick. <laughs> so he sent guys out to get a whistle for me, brought it back. And that night, it clicked. I said, OK, I understand now. That's my gimmick. And I've been blowing it since uh, May of uh, since, uh, 95. And people right. wanted to buy it. And I used to piss people off uh, blowing the whistle and stuff. And the same people who would spit on me at the ECW arena when I was came in initially came in, they had all that heat, would buy me a cocktail at the at the Marriott after, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> and that's how the whistle came about. It was Paul, all Paul Heyman's idea. Oh, I love that. So now creative. Hey, okay, Daddy. So iconic. Does he know you're selling those whistles, Heyman? No, nobody does. The back. You're my first announcement. I, I, We're going to put I, it I, everywhere. I ordered them and had a package, and my first hundred are being shipped to me. Um, I'll have them uh, by next week sometime. Okay. Um, and I haven't made the announcement. You got the the breaking news. Maybe we'll grab one. Maybe we'll get one and uh, and do a little giveaway for the episode to help promote. Oh, we'll, absolutely, we'll, absolutely. Yeah. I'll send you one for sure, one hundred percent. I'll send you a sign one. That's good advertisement for me. Thank you, uh, Jonah. Perfect. Ab oh, absolutely. Well, hey, Tyreek, I want to give it to you. Now we talked about where the whistle came from. Where does the ultimate pusher actually come from? How did you develop it, and uh, what do you see it becoming as time goes on? So as it developed, um, the ultimate pusher. Uh, so I was working uh, down in Florida one day. Uh, I was refereeing a match with uh, Chris Bay. 
Uh, he's actually he's now signed to Impact Wrestling. He's a great friend of mine. He's like a big brother of mine as well. Love Chris and Beck, he has yeah. the mind to uh, be ultimate finesse. And, you know, he doesn't use it that often anymore. So this was like around like 2020, early 2020. Uh, excuse me, uh, early 2019. Um, so, like, last year, I was like, hey, man, you know, it's okay if I use this name, the ultimate pusher, because, you know, my goal is to get deep, so I have to push people. You know, I was like, the ultimate pusher. Or, you know, yeah. and that's the really how it came up, just me uh, bugging people, just being obnoxious, loud, um, you know, whining, whining, you know, I guess it's like an actual person who's going to talk a lot of mess and get people mad. I like to push people, yeah. but that's how that name came about. You think you're going to stay like that? You like being a heel? You like listening to that heat? Um, not saying it's going to stay exactly how I am, because, you know, in the wrestling business, you never just learn everything. You can always learn. Even, you know, if I get to the stage and Mr. Fonzie is, you know, I'm still going to be learning. Um, you know, at that It's stage. a learning process still. I'm learning today, yeah. still. Right. So, you know, I'm never going to just, you know, say that who I am right now is how I want to change or what I want to say. But... You know, my manager's role is not only am I a manager on the outside, I handle the business side on the inside, backstage, uh, social media. I talk for all my clients. I make business decisions for my clients. I handle the merchandise. So not only am I on screen manager, I'm a manager of all trades. I manage my own, uh, actually manage them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you're a shoot manager, which is very cool. You're a shoot manager. Yeah, very cool, man. Yeah, shoot manager, and, and and that style of shoot managing is also on camera. So, it, you know, it, it, it makes it look very, very real. And, you know, that's why we're in the business. We're supposed to make it look real. You don't want the fans to think like, oh, man, you know, he, he you know, after he does his match and manager, you know, he goes to the back and there's just that. No, 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 no. Inside the ring, outside the ring, outside the building, social media, I'm with that guy. Definitely seems like you got the, you got a great personality for it. You have any thoughts on that, Bill? Uh, yeah, I say grab all you can and have your hands in every pot and do what somebody can't. You know what I mean? That's what I, yeah. I do. Ten jobs when I do these indie shows, everybody comes up to me and asks me to watch their matches and help with the booking and this and that. And so every company I end up going to work for and staying for, I end up being in the office. And uh, working backstage as well. And I love it because, listen, in May of 1980, when I signed with uh, Eddie Graham a contract and stayed there 10 years, all these guys, Bobo Brazil, Rocky Johnson, Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk, Terry Funk, Eddie Graham, um, Steve Curran, all these guys taught me. And it's my time now to teach the young kids now i'm the senior in the dress room and all yeah. the guys are young kids so that's uh, me uh, 40 years ago so now i pass it on so i legitimately love doing that that's my job they did it for me and now it's my job to do it for them absolutely i love that i love hearing that mentality it's a great one to have and now to to just go to more of like a, a story scene here i know before that you sent over a great a great promo video for the episode which i loved and you mentioned Thank somebody you. in there Andre the Giant. What are some memories you have of it? Yeah, look at that. Perfect. This is from the movie. Pretty yeah. Surprise, Eddie. Yeah, of course. I was just watching it the other day. Thirty yeah. years old. This wow. is thirty years old. So here's the story. In 1981, in Miami Beach Convention Center, you know Andre was a specialty. He would come in for a week and do the tour. Right. The seven day tour, and then go to the next uh, um, territory and do the tour. And he'd come in two or three times a year. For, for four or five days. And, you know, um, like the fabulous Moolah would come in for the week with the girls, uh, the world champion would come in for the week, whoever it was, Dory Funk Jr., Jack Briscoe, Harley Race, Ric Flair, whatever it was, come in for the week and, and defend their title against the number one baby face, which was Barry Windham and all those guys. Uh, so I got a great story about Andre. So I was refereeing a match at my Miami Beach Convention Center and Andre was Andre. He was huge, big, beautiful. And during the match, he didn't know I was behind him. And he back stepped and he put all his weight on my foot and he cracked a bone in my top of my foot. And to this day, 
that was in 1981. That was 30 something years ago, 38 years ago, 39 years ago, something. My foot swells up once or twice a year. Like I got the gout or something, but I don't have the gout. I go to the doctor. I've been to the doctor many times. I got cortisone shots in it. And I say, what's wrong with this thing? At the, at the first five or six years, I said, you're too young for the gout. You're, you're in shape. You eat good. It's not the gout. When they do x-ray, there's a hairline fracture, which never healed up and causes my foot to swell up every once in a while. So it still hurts to this day from 1981. My foot still hurts from Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant. Yeah, but that's a legitimate that's true a, story. Wow, uh, he, he left you with something, story. yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. I tell this story all the time. That is incredible. Just showing your years and years of experience. I can't believe that. So two giants you've been around, or are there more? Yeah. I guess big show you could yeah. say, right? Yeah. yeah. I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, Jonah. I was Always. so fortunate. Yeah. And it's lucky for me that I had the talent to back my stuff up. Because if you're not talented, you don't fit in. You know what I mean? If Because I mentioned it earlier, there's only 19 jobs as managers in the country. You know what I mean? And there's a couple hundred of us that can do what he does. It could do what I do. But yeah. fortunately for me, I got a pass. And fortunately for He's got something. He's got the it factor. So he'll make it. But you know what I mean? Hopefully he makes it all the way to WWE. You never know. Being in the right Tyreek, place. yeah. No, I see Tyreek making it for sure. So, Bill, you, you talked earlier, RVD. You're still going strong with him to this day, all the way managing back in ECW. Can you just talk about that relationship a bit? Because it, it's so much to just pick out simple, you know, moments in there. What is it overall for you and RVD? Have you liked it over the years? Well, RVD gave me a big rub when I was him. When, when he first came into ECW um, um, and they put us together, he wasn't really RVD yet. You know, he was, I mean, he was Rob Van Dam, of course, but um, he developed his character pretty damn quick and became the superstar. He's actually superhuman. He's superhuman. He does a, who does a Looks better it. five star frog splash than Rob Van Dam? Nobody. Eddie Guerrero Nobody. comes close. And he does a spectacular one, a five-star. Van Damme's, I think, a little bit better. Um, who does the uh, cross-country from turnbuckle to turnbuckle? You know what I mean? Yeah. Who does the rolling thunder? Who does? And Van Damme's a badass, too, in like real life. I, I wouldn't f with Van Damme if I had a baseball bat and a gun. He's really badass. No, for real. He's yin-yang. He's peaceful. But if you piss him off, he don't back down. He'll, he'll back up his shit. I've seen him slap around a couple people. But they deserved it. Right. I'm not going to mention any names. So I don't want to no. embarrass anybody. <laughs> what, do you, what are your thoughts on RVD then going into the Hall of Fame? After I the think story they had a better candidate. I couldn't think they had a better representation. Van Dam's really into it. He wants to be the best in the business. He wants to leave a legacy. To this year is his last year ever wrestling. He's not going to wrestle no more. He demands big money when he does. But that's okay. not the reason he's turning 50. He just turned 50. Yeah. And, he's, uh, you know, your body doesn't last, you know. Hey, I do all these conventions, Jonah, and I see these guys have been in the business for years. They're all hunched over. They got back problems. They're in wheelchairs. Look at Lex Luger. Look at all the guys. Yeah. Uh, every one of them, they can't wrestle anymore. It's this, yeah. Our bodies are not physically made for the punishment that we take. Van Damme's supernatural. He's a superhuman, really. If there's such thing in one, if, if there's it's such Van Dam, yeah, it, it's Van Dam. He's got that superpower, and he's the, one of the coolest guys you ever meet. Hey, you know we did a centerfold issue in High Times Magazine. Did you really? I had I yeah. didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. When? When? When about a few years? Uh, ago, I think it was 1999. Oh, okay. Uh, we got three page spread. I got big pictures of it because it was just 420 the other day, and everybody. Yeah. Razzling Van Dam 420, and that picture was all over the internet of me <laughs> and Sabu holding up a big thing of pot and said, Championship pot smokers. You know what I mean? It was pretty damn yeah, cool, Daddy. Yeah. Van Dam yeah. is so cool, man. Oh, and he's got a beautiful girl, Katie, who I just met. August, I mean, uh, April 3rd in that show in, in Stevens Point, uh, Wisconsin. I met Katie and I made her a shirt. I made a shirt, Fonzie. Uh, uh, RVD, the whole weapon show, the hat, black and white, beautiful shirt. She loved it. She wore it to the ring and then she wore it to the after party. And she's oh, so cool. Awesome. She's so cool. And they're in love and I'm happy for them. Van Damme's badass. He believes in right and wrong. He's on the right side, not the wrong side, you know? 
that yin yang, right, right. that the good and bad. He's a good guy, really. Yeah, he seems it. He really does from the from the outside. And it's cool to get that insight from somebody with him all these years. Tyreek, so I'm usually asking here on dream matches. I want to know now, are there any dream talent that you want to manage going forward in your career? Anybody on your list, big company, maybe on the independent circuit, who comes to mind? Uh, on the independent circuit right now? Um, there's one talent on the independent circuit that is not – He's underrated, and his name is Austin Towers. Austin Towers, seven foot monster, and I would love to work with him. Like he is on the rise right now. He's based out of uh, Alabama and Georgia, and um, when I look at him, I say, you know, he's going to be the next uh, Diesel, or he's going to be um, the next, uh, you know, Gonzalez. He's just he's a and he's a lean too. Most big guys you know, they can't move in the ring, or you know they are told not to move in the ring. He can move like a cat. Um, you would be one of the guys that I would love to manage one on one. And another person that I would love to manage, who is uh, actually signed right now, would be Chris Bay. Chris Bay is an amazing talent, and I believe that his gimmick and my gimmick they correlate. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we both have that, you know, that that, that savvy, uh, smart mouth, real glamorous, you we're, know, we're smooth and finesse. You know, I feel like you would be a great combination. That's great. That's a really good answer. Yeah, Chris Bay is incredible. Some of the stuff he does is just out of this world of impact. Never seen it before. Uh, same question for you, Bill. Is there anyone in WWE or AEW that you see or, or really anywhere that you want to – there's a, lot of super tal- there's a lot of super talent out there and, and basically i'm working the indie shows just like uh ultimate pusher um yeah. i manage um all top guys like matthew justice he's a big sabu rvd uh type guy hardcore he's a aiw world champ i manage him i manage um the brazilian giant and ariel levy in south florida and they usually put me with their top guys. So I'm set managing. I got enough talent to manage. And I manage the best RVD. Just got it. Oh, yes. in the Hall of Fame. So, you know, uh, Sabu, suicidal, homicidal. Uh, and I'm working with Sabu next Thursday night in Cleveland. I oh, nice. Yeah, they're, he, he's, they're bringing him in to wrestle Matthew Justice. Uh, check him out. Matthew Justice is badass. We Good will. Looking kid. Um, the women want to be with him and the men want to be like him. Uh, he's very cool, and he's one of their top. He's one of the top hardcore indie guys right now. Um, so they're bringing Sabu to work against them. And I did this with uh, Dixie Carter. Remember when Dixie Carter was running Orlando? TNA Impact. Yeah, exactly. They brought uh, me in to manage RBD against Sabu in the on a pay per view, and they had a great buy rate. I made big money. I was very happy. So I was stuck between Van Dam and Sabu. I give Sabu water. I give Van Dam water. <laughs> right down the middle, Daddy. You know what I mean? So it's pretty. Yeah, cool. always. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, before we wind it down, I'll ask about one last story, Fonzie, uh, for you. Okay. Would be when Lawler, you, Sabu, RVD, the the invasion to ECW. That seemed oh, like. Can you, can you get my um, WWF hat? Is in my room. Your raw one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got the I got the hat that I wore when we invaded oh, WWF. That's awesome. and all that. Uh, people offer me big money. Of course, I sell merchandise and stuff. Of course, I got jean jackets, uh, ECW and stuff. Of course, I got uh, belts and you know pictures, dope ass pictures. Uh, Very cool picture right here. This is, uh, actually, a replica is not the real, the same belt. I uh, got a picture of my favorite two wrestlers, Daddy. <laughs> I love that. One my of the greatest Daddy of all time, baby. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, so I had that raw hat. I still have the raw hat. I haven't let it go. People offered me five hundred bucks for it already, and I turned it down. I uh, uh, got my WrestleMania nine backstage pass of Caesar's Palace. Pretty dope. I've been offered a thousand dollars without turning it down. Um, not that. You know what I mean? It's one of a kind. So I might eventually sell it because it's just sitting in my closet. You know what I mean? But it's cool to right. look at. And I got pictures of me wearing it and the film of exactly. me wearing it, actual footage of me wearing this Monday Night Raw hat. You it know? might sit in there for it might sit in there for years, but when you get that one look at it, yeah, it's it's worth it, you know, to keep it in there. Oh, right, here it comes. Here it is. Thank you so much, baby. 
Got to get in the right mood. Nice. Oh, I love it. If you look at the pictures, this is the hat that I wore, Daddy. I wore it backwards. I wore it yes. frontwards. I'm doing promos with Jerry Lawler. Uh, we invaded Rose. In fact, Samu dove off the... The R. Yes. The R, yeah. yeah he dove off the R. Daddy. The, uh, the reaction from the crowd that night when you guys were in ECW, Lawler was in, he was talking to the crowd. I mean, they wanted everyone and eventually Taz came out, but like it was like a 10 minute build up. I mean, that was incredible. Can you take us through that? Because I just, I love that. I love it. It so was much. exciting working uh, with Vince again. You know, I just had left Vince in 94 and went to ECW. Uh, it was, it was thrilling. It was um, cool because the reaction we got i knew it, we would because we were on fire at that time ecw um in fact who liked us out of wwe was vince's son shane and then shane oh. turned vince on to us and then they you know what i mean and uh, yeah. we invented hardcore ecw started going through tables and the bob wire and such and such um so we were the lay down the uh the the trail uh the innovators of that and um it was quite thrilling and quite uh, exciting. And I was very lucky to be there and I'm humbled by the experience. I loved it and I played my part well and I did my job and so did everybody else. And thank you Vince McMahon for having us that weekend or that Monday night. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't have said it better. That was, that was great. Well, I'm gonna go to Tyreek now. Final question for you. What are some future goals, long-term or short-term that we could see for you in your career we could look out for? Honestly, um, right now, uh, now I, 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 I know I told you about the uh, about the, I have a daughter. Uh, she just turned six months old. Um, congratulations! Honestly, yeah, thank really, you. congrats. Thank you. Matter of fact, here she is right here. Uh, let me see. Let's see her. Here she is right here. Oh, beautiful! She uh, looks just like you. In fact, you guys she must look like the mother because you know what I mean. Oh, she's beautiful, <laughs> brother. She's beautiful. Absolutely stunning. I have a daughter, thirty-nine years old. Ah, uh, that's what's up. That's what's up. So yeah, I mean, honestly, my goal is to. I, I mean, honestly, this is everybody's goal. They want to get signed by a major company, but I really, really want to be an asset to a uh, to a company, uh, whether it's going to be AEW, NWA, uh, Impact, MLW, OVW, anywhere. You know what I'm saying? I am just really trying to get over with the fans and you know management so I can be on somebody's TV screen and make the money and talk. That's really my goal, end goal right now. Uh, and providing, you know, for my family. Uh, that's really my end goal right now. That's fantastic goals. Definitely, we will keep our eyes out for you and best of luck with everything going forward. Fonzie, how about for your future? We heard about the whistle. That's very immediate future, but uh, in the long run, what do you see happening? What do I see happening is me continuing doing podcasts, me continuing telling stories, me continuing doing these fan fests, like I'm doing May 15th in Baltimore, and I'm doing gigs all over the country. I'm going to continue doing those. I'm continuing working indie shows, continue making money, continuing entertaining people, continuing helping the young kids in the business. That's my job now to pass it forward. Right. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully I get on your show again, but don't wrap me up, Daddy, because I can talk all night long. I didn't tell you the <laughs> alligator story about uh, Roddy Piper shooting the alligator. I didn't tell you when Barry Windham got shot in the leg and had to wrestle Harley Race. Steve Curran shot Barry Windham by accident, and then he had to wrestle Harley Race 60-minute Broadway in the Miami Beach Convention Center. I didn't tell you about uh, me and Buddha, the great Japanese superstar, running over alligator. I didn't tell you about uh, the near plane crash with Kevin Sullivan, uh, superstar Billy Graham, Ron Bass, and Fonzie and Sir Oliver Humperdinck almost died in the plane crash. It's a miracle we made it through. I didn't tell you any of those stories, so don't wrap me up. Well, let's wrap it up because let's save those for next show. Uh, exactly. You got, you got to reel them in for next one. Yeah. Listen, yeah, Daddy. final question. Final question for this episode. Do you have any advice for Tyreek moving forward? Any last words of wisdom? You've given hell, some hell yeah, yeah, Tyreek. I got advice for him. Hey, always looks like somebody. Tyrese, when you go to the building, I tell all these young referees when I see him, because I was a referee for years, I uh, when I go to these, uh, when I started in CCW, the referee walked in, he had a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and tennis shoes on. And he looks like the audience. 
He looked like a member of the audience. He's a small kid. He doesn't have 22 inch pythons. He doesn't have blonde hair. So I said, brother, you got to wear a blazer. You got to look like somebody. You got to have your hair cut beautiful. You got to look and make an appearance. Appearance is everything. Appearance is everything. You got to look like a celebrity. So play your role. Uh, and be cool, be uh, uh, super fan friendly, even though you're heel or maybe whatever you are, you're still fan friendly because we're characters. There's no such thing as a heel and baby face no more. There is, but we're characters. So play a character of cool, dress the part, uh, be fan friendly, um, do all you can do, pass it forward, uh, learn as much as you can, and, uh, and good luck, Tyrese. Thank you, Mr. Bill. That really. You know, that yes, I really appreciate that. Yeah, man. That was awesome. I've had a bunch of fun on this episode. This was awesome, guys. Uh, thank you so much both for coming on. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, that'll finish us off. I had a great time, Jonah. I love your show. I've watched it before. Um, and Have you uh, really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Uh, since my assistant told me that I was coming on the show, I was thrilled. And then I will watch some back episodes and stuff. You're very cool, Daddy. You got your together thank very you cool. thank you so much that means a lot it's a great compliment what's going on everybody jonah from rewind recap your live you just watched a bunch of me which whatever video this is on you've definitely at least watched a few minutes so i'm going to tell you right now you know what i'm about to say and you know that you have to do it head over to wrestlingpins.bigcartel.com right now you're gonna not regret it you're gonna pick up some pins whatever pins i got over there right now they're the best in the business best merchandise out there go pick up some pins Use the code RRR150FF, get 15% off your order, and I'll see you soon. Woo, that's it, Daddy. Book and Wooka Man feel good. I tell my people and my brothers and sisters, don't you dare, don't you dare miss online, rewind, recap, relive. Oh, 